Well, good morning and welcome to Community Christian Church. I'm glad that we're worshiping together. We're worshiping in a new way this morning. With COVID-19 circulating in our community, it's time for us to find creative ways to be together and to be in the presence of God. I appreciate your flexibility so much and your support of the ministries of this church, even though we're not in the same room together. This morning, I invite you to have your own communion in front of you so that you can join together when we have communion. I invite you to have a Bible so you can follow along with our scripture. And if you have a hymnal at home, follow along with our music. We're going to do our best to adapt and to change and be creative in this season where we need to be responsibly socially distant. So thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm hoping that we can pray together and learn together and grow together and sing together and experience scripture together, even if we're not in the same room. My blessings and my prayers to each of you. follow along in our call to worship this morning. It's number 451 in the Chalice Hymnal. O God, who sent Jesus into the world, not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life to set others free, shape us for your ministry. Claim us, O God, for your service, and direct us toward your will. You have graced all members of Christ's body one by one with gifts of the Spirit to fulfill their vocation, 
to lead lives worthy of your calling, to be workers who have no reason to be ashamed, to shine as lights of your glory. You have granted each of us the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. You give grace according to the measure of Christ's gift, and some are called to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Grant that together we may all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of your Son, to the full stature of Christ. Through your grace, O God, may we lead a life worthy of the vocation to which you call us. Claim us, O God, for your service and direct us toward your will. Wait, where is everybody? I can't see anyone. I can't see. Oh, that's right. I have a blindfold on. Do you ever wonder what it'd be like if you were blind? It'd be kind of hard, wouldn't it? Well, there's a story in the Bible about Jesus and how he heals a blind man. And I'm going to just read you a little part of it. They asked Jesus why this guy was born blind and, and why did they do something wrong? Did his parents do something wrong? And Jesus says, no, neither this man or his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he said this, he spat on the ground and he made mud with the saliva and he spread the mud in the man's eyes saying to him, go wash in the pool. Then he went and washed and he came back. He was able to see. So do you know anybody that's blind? I know a few people. And I'm sure it was very hard. It's very hard to be blind. Some people are born blind and some people, something happens that they become blind. And then there are some people who can see but, but are blinded by the unknown. Well, right now, I feel like we're all a little bit blinded by the unknown. There may be people you know that are getting sick there may be places you want to go, but you can't because they are closed, just like the church. I want to be with you all at church, but we can't be together right now because we don't want to spread this virus. We can't see what's going to happen next, but we can know that Jesus will be with us every step of the way. Just like the blind man, he will help us to see. I can't wait to be together again, but for now, we must look after each other from a distance. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the health care worker who are helping us to stay well. Help us to trust in you and Jesus so we can see our way through this most difficult time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.
now is the time in the service where we are going to say a prayer together. Normally I would take your requests and I'm sure at this time you have a lot on your mind and a lot that you want prayer for. So hopefully uh, I can address some of those things for you. And I'll also pray for the unspoken prayers. In general, we're going to pray for this time, for the uncertainty, for the worry, and that everyone can stay healthy in our country, in our city, in the world. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to share in prayer through the airwaves, through digital means, when it is unsafe for us to gather in person. God, we thank you for all of the advances in technology that allow us to have these intimate moments with each other in a safe place. God, we thank you for the church. We thank you for this building. We thank you that it is a place for community, for fellowship, for family. And I thank you and we thank you for how together this congregation is. Lord, we pray for health in this time when the world is sick and disease and viruses and global warming and war and hate and discrimination. All of these things are happening. God, sometimes these things seem distant. And it's easy for us to turn and look another way and be grateful that it's not happening to us. Well, God, right now we're in a time where everyone is affected by this virus, uh, whether we see it or not. And that is the unknown, especially with an enemy that we cannot see. God, we pray that you keep us safe. Pray that you keep our immune system strong. We thank you that uh, you provide the means uh, for people to stay home and not have to go out and risk getting sick. God, we pray for those who are sick, whether it's from this virus or whether it's another sickness be it chronic or temporary, God, we pray for the health of everyone in this congregation, for the health of their families and their friends and all of those on their heart. We pray for the families of those who have passed away because of this virus worldwide by the thousands. Uh, God, it, it's, a, it's a tremendous impact when something like that happens and we're grateful uh, that we can come together in this time and pray. That is the most powerful thing we can do, is pray. And God, we come to you humbled and in awe of your majesty and your beauty and your wisdom and your guidance. We pray that you keep us safe. We pray that you continue to guide us and Bring us back together when it is safe to do so. We pray for all of those who are worried. We pray that you give them peace. We pray for all of those who are traveling or have family who are traveling. We pray that you keep them safe where they are or provide safe means to get them home. God, we pray that when we are able to come back together, whether that be next week or some time from now, that we could all come together and continue to appreciate the gift that it is to have community. We are social beings created to be social. And so it's uncomfortable when we have to distance ourselves from that. But we understand that sometimes it's necessary. 
whether we agree with it or not. God, we thank you for the opportunity to do so and for the guidance of our leadership at this church and the hard decisions that they have to make. We pray for all of the unspoken prayer requests at this time and for the upcoming week that you would guide us and that you would keep us safe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. with me now the scripture reading from the gospel of John chapter 9. As he walked along he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is that not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it's someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. Then he said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought the Pharisees to the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes. Then I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. 
The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you said was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. For the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know is that I was blind, and now I see. Will you join me in the spirit of prayer? God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, here we are on the third Sunday of Lent, and I'm alone in this church. I'm here worshiping without you, and I miss you so much. This is an unusual way for us to do worship and for me to share the message. And I rarely get to sit in the pews, so I'm happy to be sitting where you sit, usually. We're here on the third Sunday of Lent, in this time where we're supposed to be drawing closer to God and to one another. We're supposed to be taking on religious practices even more than we do in our ordinary lives. We're supposed to be coming to church more and taking on spiritual discipline more, praying more, learning more, and yet here we are apart from one another. And you're watching this on your computer or on your DVD player. And I'm sitting in the church all by myself with a message. I also changed the scripture. If you've been following along in the Voice newsletter, you were probably expecting the story of the woman at the well. But I skipped ahead to what we normally had on March 22nd, and instead I read it today for March 15th. Today is the story of the blind man who's healed by Christ. I switched this because for times like this, in the situation we're in, it seemed more appropriate. I want to start by telling you a story, one I've never told you before. In the weeks before my wedding, Andrew and I had what often people have when they're preparing for a big wedding like ours. We had a tasting. This was a time where we got to go to the Harvard Faculty Club, the site of our reception, and try the whole menu that would be served at our wedding reception. We were expecting almost 200 people at our wedding, so my mom and Andrew and I, we went to the Harvard Faculty Club and had our reception food to taste it and to decide what salad dressings we'd have and what past appetizers we would finally choose for our reception. The night was amazing. We tried little egg rolls and we tried fried asparagus and decided which one we should pass. We tried three different salads with three different dressings and decided which one we'd serve to our guests. We settled on penne pasta with chicken parmesan for our entree and we tried all the different wines that they might serve at the reception. This was an amazing tasting experience for our wedding reception. And then later that night, back at my little apartment with one bathroom, about two hours after bedtime, I heard my mom sick in the restroom. Immediately I thought, maybe she had too much wine. But 20 minutes later, we were in strict competition for that restroom because I too was sick. All of a sudden, those little egg rolls didn't seem so great. That fried asparagus was disgusting. I don't think I could eat penne pasta with chicken parmesan ever again. We were both sick for the whole day, the whole night. So we woke up the next morning thinking, we've got to change our menu. That tasting experience will never work. We both got sick. In the days following, we found out that the Harvard Faculty Club had a huge outbreak of the norovirus, and they were shutting down indefinitely to clean and sanitize and all events that had to take place in the time they were closed would be canceled. My first thought when this happened was complete selfish devastation. Is my wedding reception going to be rescheduled or canceled or moved? What will we tell our guests? 
We'd already sent out invitations. We'd already picked our menu. Everything was planned. Every corner we were going to decorate, every part of it, down to the last detail and the last flower, we had decided on. And now the Harvard Faculty Club was shutting down, sanitizing everything because of the norovirus outbreak. My first thought had everything to do with me as an individual. Why would this happen to me? What did I do to deserve this? How could this be? Why would this be such a horrible coincidence around my wedding? But after letting that first reaction pass, I started to realize that they weren't making a decision for me as an individual. This was a decision that Harvard needed to make for the whole community. They were making the decision to protect the older scholars who came into town to lecture at Harvard and would enjoy meals at the faculty club and potentially become sick. They were doing it for those who were having immunocompromising issues and it wouldn't be safe for them to be in an environment with a potential virus afoot. They were doing it for the people who would be most vulnerable and most susceptible to what was going around. I learned later that the norovirus is something that kills 200,000 people in the world every year, and 50,000 of those are children under age five. The Harvard Faculty Club was making an important decision for the community. It wasn't for me as an individual. It was for the sake of the health and well-being of everyone around me. But sometimes when things are unusual or get off track or our plans are disrupted, it's easy to think to ourselves that this must be some sort of sign or it must be something that's happening to us personally. Is God punishing us? Are we facing bad luck because we've done something wrong and we deserve it? Is this about us and are we being punished? Sometimes when we face a crisis or a change in plans, it's easy to start thinking about it as something that personally is only affecting us and it's a detriment to us and that God has arranged this and punished us through these actions. People have been doing this for all of time. In fact, our scripture today is about a man who faces a health crisis and the way his community responds. In our scripture today, there's a man who's been blind since birth and everybody knows that he's been blind since birth. And when Jesus comes to town, people start asking him, well, Jesus, is this my man blind from birth because he deserves it? Is he being punished? Are his parents being punished? In many ways, they're asking that age-old question. Does everything happen for a reason? And is this part of your plan? And what's interesting about our scripture is that God doesn't entertain any of that. Jesus says, I'm not even going to dignify that with a response. The questions about whether or not everything happens for a reason or the bad things that happen, are they punishment or are they someone's fault? Jesus doesn't engage in that because it's not true and it's not important. Instead, in the scripture, we see that Jesus heals the man. He spits in the dirt and then wipes dirt in the man's eyes and all of a sudden he can see. And even though the people of this community see an amazing healing, they see Jesus spit in the mud, wipe mud in a man's eyes, and then he can see. The spirit of healing and transformation is lost on this community. Instead, their responses are all about protocol and procedure and Sabbath. They get agitated saying, well, you shouldn't do a healing on the Sabbath because on the Sabbath, we always do X, Y, and Z. That's against religious law. That's against how we always do things. That's against our tradition. They're missing the spirit of healing because they're so focused on the way things are always done and what we're supposed to do on the Sabbath. They miss the miracle of what God can do in our communities because they're so focused on what they themselves are used to and what they need. But nonetheless, this man is healed. Transformation happens in his life. In this scripture, we're talking about vision. And you might think we're talking about the blind man receiving sight, but that's not the theme for today at all. The important transformation of vision were the people who began to see that Jesus himself would go outside of Sabbath practices, outside of the most traditional ways of healing and connecting with people, outside of protocol and what everyone was used to, and Jesus was committing to healing. 
was committed to transformation wherever it would happen. The vision that is most important in this scripture is for all of us to see that God works outside the lines, works outside the parameters, works outside the traditions that we're used to, that Jesus himself does things outside of the ordinary and outside of our routines, that healing and community and bringing people together is always the most priority of Jesus. And that can happen in a lot of different ways. So in this COVID-19 epidemic, pandemic, where we're separated, where we're not worshiping together, where we need vision and we need connection and we need to access God and feel close to Christ. May we learn from this scripture that Jesus does the work in the community where it's needed. What does love require of us? What is God calling us to do? It has nothing to do with following what we normally do on a Sabbath day, which is joining in one room together for rituals and songs and lessons. Instead, it's about how we love our neighbors. How can we join together not focused on what we need as individuals. I know it's part of your routine to come to church on Sundays. I know so many things about your routine are being disrupted. Schools, kids, schools are closed, kids are home, workplaces are closing, grocery stores are emptying out. It can be unsettling. And I know that it must be putting so many of us on edge. But I love the scripture because it talks about what Jesus does and what Jesus values and how Jesus loves. And what Jesus does and what Jesus values and the ways that Jesus loves is always prioritizing healing, always prioritizing what's good for the community, and even if it means we disrupt our Sabbath routine, and even if it means that things happen in unconventional ways, like healing through spit and mud, like church through the computer or the DVD player, even, even if it's different, God is still speaking, God is still present, and we're still the church. And our scripture today talks about Jesus' value on health and on community and on healing in all sorts of creative ways. So I want to thank you for adapting. I want to thank you for following the gospel, which is different than the church. God is bigger than the building. Christ is bigger than what we do in this very space. And you're doing the work of God and the work of Christ to protect our community to value health and healing, and to love your neighbor as you would love yourself. So thank you for that work, and thank you for worshiping with us in this way. Amen. Each week, we're going to remind you, even if you're not in the worship service, to consider giving back to your church that does so much for our community and for our congregation. There are going to be alternative ways to give to the church in this time where we're apart. We invite you to contact Jack Hartley, Reach out to see how you can send in your contribution and your pledge and a donation so that we can continue to pay the staff, to maintain our building, and to maintain the outreach ministries of this church that means so much. We invite you to consider giving generously, to remember that the ministry we do is important. Even if we're not in the same room, we invite you to give out of the abundance that you might have, the blessings that God has given you so that our church can remain faithful. Let us pray. Loving God, even in these times of scarcity and fear, we invite you to stir generosity, to invite our congregation to pour out support so that our church can remain strong. We expect there to be a hit. When we are not together and passing the offering plate, we know that there will be financial struggle for the church. So we invite you to inspire our members to send in contributions and donations and pledges still, even when we're not meeting. God, we trust that you will inspire us to be responsible with all that is given to the church. In the name of Christ, amen.
Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us. For our use thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine we are. Early let us seek thy favor, Early let us do thy will, blessed Lord and only Savior, with thy love our spirits fill. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast loved us, love us still. Well, here we are at the communion table at Community Christian Church. If you're watching this at home, we hope that you would set out bread and a cup for yourself so that we can share in communion together. For as long as we are doing this remotely, we invite you to set yourself up with communion at home. In our denomination, the Disciples of Christ, we have ministry of all believers, so anyone can serve communion and receive communion, and that means that you can preside at your own communion table today, and we hope that you do. You are welcome at this table. All are welcome at this table. This is an open table. You're welcome here whether you believe a little or a lot, whether you have been baptized or not, whether you're a member of Community Christian Church or no church, you're welcome at this table because it's God's table for all. Let us pray. Dear God, bless this bread as it represents your broken body. Amen. Dear Lord, we are reminded of the love you have for each of us in, in this cup. Please bless this cup we are about to partake of. Amen. We remember on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples in an upper room. He took a loaf of bread and blessed it and then broke it for all things that are broken. And Jesus said, take, eat, all of you. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, Jesus took the cup and gave thanks for it and blessed it and then gave it to his disciples and said, drink deeply from this cup, all of you. In it is a new covenant in my blood for you. Do this and remember me. Every time that we eat this bread and we drink from this cup, we proclaim that Christ lives among us until we meet again. Will you join me praying the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now receive this blessing. May the God who created you in the image of goodness, the Holy Spirit who breathed into you the breath of life, and Christ who went ahead of us all, teaching us the way of love, send you out of here in peace. Amen. Amen.